بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Insha'Allah Ta'ala in today's talk and this is part two last lesson we gave was about Sha'ban and the virtues of this blessed month and why in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would fast many days of this month of Sha'ban and today we're going to speak about another major event that happens during this month so last time we mentioned that one of the major events that happens during the month of Sha'ban is that the deeds are taken up and they are raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way to prepare for that is to fast. Fast as many days as you can. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, هو شهر ترفع فيه الأعمال إلى رب العالمين فأحب أن يرفع عملي وأنا صائم. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, that this, the month of Sha'ban, is the month in which the deeds are taken up and they are raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An entire year worth of deeds go up to Allah azza wa jal. So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I love that my deeds are presented to Allah while I am fasting. And so we learn from this that fasting gives our deeds a much better chance for them to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I mentioned in last lesson, the reason for that is because fasting is a tawbah in and of itself. And you can go and watch the clip for that. Also, in addition to this, my brothers and sisters in Islam, you should know that fasting is not only preparing our deeds for acceptance. Fasting doesn't only prepare our deeds for acceptance by Allah Azza wa Jal, but it also prepares us for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the inevitable meeting with Allah azza wa jal. Fasting prepares us for that. Allahu Akbar. And so I want you to notice something yani incredible in how things were legislated in our deen. You know, this is why all the recommended days of fasting, they are followed up by an event that reminds us of the day of judgment and reminds us of the meeting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever noticed this? And let me explain to you something. For example, fasting Thursday is a sunnah. We all know this. And the next day, after, after Thursday, the next day is Friday. And Friday is a day in which the hour occurs. The day of judgment, the hour happens on a Friday. And so Friday is the beginning of our return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the paradise, we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord, on a Friday. So we fast Thursday in order to prepare for our meeting with Allah azza wa jal, which would be on a Friday. Also, look at the example of Ramadan. We fast Ramadan, or fasting Ramadan is an obligation. And the next event right after Ramadan is Al-Hajj. And when does Hajj begin? Hajj begins literally on the first of Shawwal. That's the beginning months of the Hajj. And Al-Hajj, it reminds us of the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the fact that we take our clothes off and we wear the ihram, this reminds us of leaving the worldly life behind. We leave everything behind. And then you have Arafah and Muzdalifa. Muzdalifa is when you sleep on the earth. There is no tent, no nothing. All you can see is the sky above you. And sleeping in Muzdalifa, it reminds us of our death, Hayatul Barzakh, the life of the grave. And then when we wake up the next morning, which is the day of an nahr the day of the Hajj, it reminds us of resurrection. And then when we head towards at tawaf on the final day of Al-Hajj, after we stone, that reminds us of our meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we go back to the house of Allah, meaning we're going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated for us fasting Ramadan in order to prepare with the meeting with Allah azza wa jal. Because the, the, the event that follows Ramadan 
is Al-Hajj. Al-Hajj is a meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the case of Monday. When we fast Monday, fasting Monday, we fast Monday because it reminds us also of the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is that the case? You see, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born on a Monday and he died on Monday and his birth and his death is a minor sign of the hour. And what's next? What's the next event after all the signs of the hour are complete? The day of judgment, the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar. So therefore, we fast Monday and Monday, fasting Monday prepares us with the meeting with Allah Azza wa Jal because Monday is reminding us that this is the signs of the hour when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born on that Monday and he died on Monday. And after all the signs of the hour are complete, the next event is the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar. Similarly, the six days of Shawwal and the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, these are all days within the months of Al-Hajj and Al-Hajj. Once again, we said it reminds us of our return and our meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah. And you know, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Musa alayhi salam an appointment to meet him at Jabal al-Tur, on the Mount of al-Tur, in order for Allah Azza wa Jal to speak to Musa and to give him a Tawrah, Allah Azza wa Jal commanded Musa alayhi salam to prepare for that meeting with Allah by fasting. And so he fasted, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Musa alayhi salam, he fasted 40 days, 40 days before he met Allah. So fasting, I'm telling you, it prepares us for the meeting with Allah Azza wa Jal. It doesn't only prepare our deeds to be accepted by Allah when they're raised. Fasting also prepares us for the meeting with Allah Azza wa Jal. Look what Allah said to Musa. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said in the Quran, وَوَاعَدْنَا مُوسَىٰ ثَلَاثِينَ لَيْلَةً وَأَتْمَمْنَاهَا بِعَشْرٍ Allah Azza wa Jal commanded Musa alayhi salam to fast 40 days. Continuous fasting, non-stop. This is why in the ayah Allah Azza wa Jal said, 30 nights. And this, it is an indication to the fact that he was fasting the nights and the days. Allahu Akbar. So Musa alayhi salam, he fasted 30 days and nights straight, non-stop. And then at the end, he used a siwak to change the breath of his mouth. So then, Allah, because he's going to meet Allah on the mountain and receive a Torah. So then Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him to fast an extra 10 days because the breath of the fasting person is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the smell and the fragrance of musk. So he completed an extra 10 days and it was a total of 40 days. So the point was Allah Azza wa Jal prepared Musa alayhi salam for the meeting with himself, with Allah, by commanding Musa to fast continuously 40 days in order for him to be ready and prepared and deserve meeting and talking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar. So now my brothers and sisters in Islam, you know that fasting doesn't only prepare our deeds for acceptance by Allah azza wa jal, fasting also prepares us for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, how exactly does fasting prepare us for the meeting with Allah Azza wa Jal? How does fasting prepare us? How does it actually prepare us for the meeting with Allah Azza wa Jal? You know, the one who wants to meet Allah and desires the pleasure of Allah and he desires the reward of the hereafter, the one who desires all this must be detached from this worldly life and its luxuries, no doubt. Anyone who wants to meet Allah must meet him while he's in a state of detachment from this worldly life and all its luxuries. And fasting allows a person to achieve this status because when fasting, when a person fasts, he is kept away from the ultimate luxuries of this worldly life of food and drink and sexual relations, Allahu Akbar. That's why fasting prepares us to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
because it cuts us away from the luxuries of this life and the one who is serious about meeting Allah Azza wa Jal must be cut off from this worldly life and only longing and expecting and desiring that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for him in reward in the paradise. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, that's the first event that we spoke about, our deeds being raised, and the way you're going to prepare for this is by fasting. Now the second major event that happens during this month of Sha'bab, and it is happening and it will happen on the 15th night of Sha'bab, so that would be uh, Sunday the 28th of March after Maghrib, that would be considered the 15th night. Uh, of course, according to those who uh, started the month of Shawwal, on Sunday, uh, so if you started uh, Shawwal on the sorry, if you started Shawwal on the fifteenth of March, then the fifteenth of Shaban is going to be on the twenty eighth of March, which be Sunday after Maghrib. That would be the fifteenth night. This is the second major event that happens during this month of Shaban. That on the fifteenth night, and this night is just as important and significant as the previous one. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said concerning this night, يَطَّلِعُ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَىٰ إِلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ لَيْلَةً نُصْفِ مِنْ شَعْبَانِ فَيَغْفِرُ لِجَمِيعِ خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا لِمُشْرِكٍ أَوْ مُشَاحٍ Allahu Akbar. Allah Azza wa Jal, He looks and He observes the creation on the 15th night of the month of Shaban. And he forgives everyone. Allahu Akbar. Even this is the major, major event that is happening. Allah Azza wa Jal is going to overlook and he is going to observe his creation on this night. And he's going to forgive every single person except for a mushrik, a disbeliever, and a mushahin. A mushahin is the one who has enmity and hatred in his heart towards another Muslim brother or sister. Allahu Akbar. Yattali'u Allah. Allah would yattali'u. Now the word yattali'u is to observe. But to observe even the most minute and hidden of things. So the word yattali'u, it suggests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to look at our intentions and the secrets of the hearts and whatever our hearts are harboring and carrying. Allahu Akbar. Now, definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sees our hearts all time and every moment of the day and the night of every single day of the year. That's no doubt. But during the 15th night of Sha'ban, there is a special observance at the servants and their hearts and their intentions. And so this is the second major event that Allah Azza wa Jal looks at the hearts your heart is presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar. And so these are the major, the two major events of the month of Sha'ban. That the records, your deeds are raised to Allah azza wa jal, Allahu A'lam when. It could be any day and any night of this month. Some scholars said that the records are raised to Allah azza wa jal after the 15th of Sha'ban. So that the 15th comes, you're completely forgiven. And then your deeds go up to Allah Azza wa Jal, and now they are in a much better position for them to be accepted by Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. So this is why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would fast all of Sha'ban or the majority of the days of Sha'ban because we really don't know when the record will be raised. But some scholars did say that it happens after the 15th of Sha'ban. And the second major event is that Allah looks at your heart your heart will be presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will forgive everyone except a mushrik, a disbeliever, someone who associated partners with Allah. He doesn't deserve forgiveness. And a mushahin, a mushahin, the one who holds hatred against another Muslim brother or sister. And I'm going to explain this at the end, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the question now is, is your heart ready? to be presented before Allah Azza wa Jal in three days. The 15th night of Sha'ban is only in the next three days. In three days, on Sunday night, this heart with all its temptations and sickness and disease and sins, is it ready to be presented before Allah Azza wa Jal? Does it deserve the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal or not? How much work, how much preparation and how much cleaning and how much purification does your heart need 
before it's presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no more time to waste. There's only three more days and this major event is going to happen. Allahu Akbar, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Wallah, this is a serious event. The heart being presented before Allah azza wa jal. And there's a hadith that informs us about this and we know exactly when it's going to happen. So how can someone be lazy after this? Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the most serious form of illness and sickness is the illness of the heart, the spiritual illness. Wallah, this is the most serious form of illness, the disease of the heart, the heart that's filled with hypocrisy, jealousy, hatred, doubts, arrogance, and so on. This is the most serious form of illness. You know, today, if a person becomes physically ill, let's say he had, يعني, may Allah Azza wa Jal preserve us and protect us, he had cancer or diabetes or whatever it is of the sicknesses, he will not think twice about paying all his savings to find the best of cure for himself. And he might even spend thousands and thousands traveling from country to country looking for the best and the best of doctors, seeking a treatment for his illness and disease. And at the same time, if his heart was diseased with hypocrisy and jealousy and hatred and doubts and arrogance and impermissible desires and temptations and sins, you weren't finding having that concern to look for a scholar in order to find a treatment in the Quran, a sunnah, that would cure the diseased heart, Allahu Akbar. And the irony, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is that the disease of the heart is much, much worse than the physical illness. Yani physical illnesses, they are a means of forgiveness. If you remain patient, if someone is physically ill and he remained patient, that's a source of forgiveness. And extra hasanat and ranks with Allah and raised levels in the paradise. And physical illness is only something temporary. And sooner or later, it'll either be cured or you'll die from your illness. And that's it. That's the end of it. However, the disease of the heart, the hypocrisy, the jealousy, the hatred and the doubts and the arrogance that are in the heart, these are a source of punishment. Unlike physical illnesses, they're a source of forgiveness and mercy. But the disease of the heart that's a source of punishment if you don't rush to treat it and repent. And 15th of Sha'ban is an opportunity to have everything cleansed and wiped. And the consequences of the disease of the heart, it's not temporary, it's permanent, it remains. The consequences of the diseases of the heart will give you a miserable life and they will follow you in your grave and they will meet you on the day of judgment until you meet Allah Azza wa Jal. And then Allahu A'lam what Allah Azza wa Jal does with such a person, Allahu Akbar. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, we need to focus on our hearts right now. Right now we need to focus on the heart because it's going to be presented to Allah Azza wa Jal within three days. We need to purify the heart in order to earn the forgiveness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We need to treat this heart. Let me share with you a couple of steps in, in terms of how you can treat this heart because we need to be serious here. I need to give you a plan a practical plan on what you're supposed to do. Number one, to treat this sick heart. Number one, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because your heart is in the hands of Allah azza wa jal. No one can change the state and the affair of your heart other than Allah azza wa jal. Why? Because your heart right now is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna quluba bani adam كلها بين إصبعين من أصابع الرحمن كقلب واحد يصرفه حيث يشاء الله أكبر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that the hearts of mankind all of them are between the fingers of Allah سبحانه وتعالى between two fingers of Allah سبحانه وتعالى كقلب واحد like one heart الله أكبر يُصَرِّفُهُ حَيْثُ شَاءُ Allah Azza wa Jal guides and misguides whoever he, went, he wants, however he wants. The heart, your heart is in the hands of Allah. He guides and he misguides whoever he wants. 
So then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say, Allahumma musarrif al-qulub, sarrif qulubana ala ta'atik. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make a dua, and he would say, Oh Allah, musarrif al-qulub, the one who guides and misguides the hearts. Oh Allah, make our hearts firm and steadfast upon your obedience. Oh Allah, change the state of our heart from sin to obedience, from disobedience to to obedience, from your displeasure to your pleasure. Now, that's the first thing in terms of how you're going to treat this heart. Turn to Allah and ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give firmness and steadfastness to your heart because your heart is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal and it is He who guides it or misguides it. Allahu Akbar. Number two, the way you're going to treat this sick heart before the 15th of Sha'ban and then for the rest of your life, you're going to use these methods to treat this sick heart is mujahadatun nafs. You need to strive and struggle against yourself to keep away from filth and sins. You need to struggle and strive against yourself. Allah Azza wa said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who strive and struggle against themselves always aware and conscious whenever they fall in a sin, they keep away from it. They repent, they move away as best as they can. These people, لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ subulana, Allah would guide them to his path, Allahu Akbar, meaning their heart would be clean and it would be purified. The third way to treat this heart is to attend the gatherings of righteousness. Find good friends for yourself. Find a good brotherhood, find a good sisterhood and stick to that. Attend lessons, Islamic lessons. Listen to Islamic lessons. These matters would purify your heart. These are something you have to do, you must do in order to achieve a pure heart. And the final thing I can uh, suggest to you on this point is dhikrullahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, nothing will clean your heart more than dhikrullahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is going to purify your heart more than dhikr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With the dhikr of Allah, the hearts are reformed, the hearts are mended, the hearts are polished and they are cleansed. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, Ala bi dhikri Allah tatma'innu al-qulub. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, It is only by the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find tranquility and peace. And if your heart is tranquil and it's peaceful, that means it's away from all illnesses and diseases of the heart. It is impossible for a peaceful, tranquil heart to have arrogance and hatred and envy and jealousy within it. For dhikrullahi subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to cleanse and purify your heart. The dhikr in the morning, the dhikr in the afternoon, dhikrullah when you wake up, dhikrullah before you go to sleep, dhikrullah after the prayers, before you leave the house, upon entering the house, when you go to the masjid, going in the masjid, coming out, all of this, you need to continuously make dhikrullah in order for the heart to be pure and clean. And as a result, it will be accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal and a person earns complete forgiveness. You need to continuously struggle against yourself in reciting a dhikr until dhikrullah becomes like water flowing out of your mouth. Allahu Akbar. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, look at this beautiful hadith, the hadith of the 15th night of Sha'bat. Allah is going to observe and look at the hearts of each and every single sleeve of his on this earth on the 15th night of Sha'bat. You know the word, it's usually used in a court setting. Yani for example, in a court, they will say, and so on, so on. They would say, yani the word I just want you to know how it's used, in what context it's used. It's used in a court setting. For example, the judge would say, after al after an extensive look into the case, after looking at all relevant paperwork, after looking at the most minute of evidence, the court has issued a verdict. So the idea is, the word yattali'a, the word yattali'a, what usually happens after it is a judgment and a verdict. And so Allah Azza wa Jal observes the hearts of the servants. After he observes the hearts, 
after he looks at the hearts of the servants of the 15th night of Shaban, there's a verdict after this. There's a decision. There's a judgment that Allah has made. And that is Allah Azza wa Jal has decided and has decreed and has judged that he is going to forgive all his creation. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. لِجَمِيعِ خَلْقِهِ All his creation. In another narration, فَيَغْفِرُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ He is going to forgive all the believers. Allahu Akbar, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, he's going to forgive. He's going to forgive. There's an exception. There are two types that are not forgiven. I'm going to share at the end, but let's now focus on this forgiveness. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he said, وَيَتَعَيَّنُ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمْ أَنْ يَجْتَنِبَ الذُّنُوبِ أَلَّتِي تَمْنَعُ مِنَ الْمَغْفِرَةِ Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he said, that a believer, he must, must keep away from sins that block him from the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A believer must keep away from sins because sins, they would block a person they would deprive a person from the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One must avoid sins in order to earn Allah azza wa jal's forgiveness for this night, the night of Sha'bat. And these sins, of course, we're speaking about major sins like a shirk and killing innocent persons and a zina. As Allah azza wa jal mentioned these three sins in Surah Al-Furqan. But let me share with you something. I know this is a complaint that the majority have. How do we stop committing a sin? And Anna, يعني, even though this is a huge lesson and it will require a longer time, except that now I want to share with you something small. I think it would be a good suggestion and a solution and a practical solution that bi'ithnillahi ta'ala will help you stop committing sins. It will help you stop committing sins bi'ithnillah. Remember, we need to stop committing sins in order to earn Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness on this night of the 15th night of Sha'ban. Listen, how are we going to stop these sins? Wallahi, I will discuss it with you and I want you to implement it the next time your nafs calls you to a sin. Listen to this solution. As you approach committing this sin, right? Remember what I'm saying. So now, a shaytan has whispered in your mind, your desire is starting to build up bit by bit, and you feel like approaching and committing a sin, especially the sins that are in private, watching something that is impermissible, taking a drug, for example, drinking alcohol in secret because your parents or your friends don't know about it, going through your spouse's phone, also that is haram and that's a sin, and the, the, there's a desire to do that, when you approach to commit a sin, I tell you what, there is always, always a feeling of fee in the heart of a believer. 100%. There is some feeling inside your heart. Obviously, this is what makes us believers. That we believe that Allah sees us when we commit sins. No one denies this fact. Even in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he referred to that feeling in your heart. When you approach a sin, he referred to it as fi qalbi kulli mu'min. That feeling of fee that Allah is watching over you, that and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam referred to it as the warner that is in the heart of every believer. So what I want you to do when you approach a sin in private, don't ignore that sense of fear in your heart. Don't ignore that sense of Allah watching over you. Don't. Rather, I want you to do this. Take advantage of that feeling. And say to yourself these words aloud. Say, Allah is watching me. Don't ignore the feeling. When you suppress and ignore the feeling that Allah is watching over you, you commit the sin. Rather, what you're supposed to do at that moment, take advantage and say the words aloud. Say, Allah is watching me. Read the words of Allah in Surah Al-Alaq. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Doesn't he know that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching over you? And, say, and answer, answer the question of Allah. Answer it. And say, oh Allah, yes, I know you are watching over me. And I'm going to act by this knowledge that I know. 
and I'm going to stop the sin and what I'm doing right now. I'm ashamed of myself, oh Allah. I'm going to stop. Look, Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was in that setting and the wife of Al-Aziz came and wanted to tempt him and make him fall into the sin and she was alone with him in the room, Yusuf alayhi salam, the first thing he said was, Ma'ad Allah. May Allah protect me from this. He mentioned the word Allah. Don't ignore the feeling of fear of Allah in your heart. Don't ignore it. Raise it. Bring it out to your tongue. Say it. Start mentioning. Say, A'udhu Billah. Say, Allah can watch me. Say the words. Yastaghfoona min al-nas wa la yastaghfoona min Allah. As Allah said in the Quran. Say it. Say it, Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, they cover their sins from the people out of fee of being exposed and they don't cover their sins out of fee from Allah. وَهُوَ مَعَهُمْ And Allah is with them all the time. He can see them and what they do. Take advantage of that feeling of fee in your heart when you're doing the sin and bring it up. Don't ignore it. If you ignore it, you're going to fall into the sin. Allahu Akbar. Don't ignore this feeling. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, if you remember Allah and you remember the name of Allah and you say, Ma'adh Allah, just before you commit a sin, Wallahi, the mention of Allah will destroy the temptation and the desire instantly, instantly. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَلَا يَثْقُلُ مَعَسْمِ اللَّهِ شَيْءٍ Nothing is heavy when it's weighed with the name of Allah. So if you're mentioning Allah and you're saying Ma'ad Allah and you're saying I fear Allah and you're saying these words aloud, if they are weighed with your desire and your temptation to do the haram, to watch the haram, if you're mentioning Allah's name and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said nothing will ever outweigh Allah's name. Therefore, your temptation and your desire will be shattered instantly. Allahu Akbar, trust me. Trust me, Allah, trust me, my brothers and sisters in Islam. The temptation will cease to exist. It'll go away. At that moment, at that moment when you feel like it's gone, <clears throat> congratulations. That's the moment in where you have defeated a shaitan. Afterwards, after you've mentioned Allah and you feel like the temptation has gone away, remember a shaitan can come back and he will come back. So what you need to do afterwards, move away from that place. If you're at a computer screen, if you're in your room with your mobile device, move out of that room, go to somewhere to a public area where your parents are sitting, where your family is sitting, where your spouse is. Move, get out of a private space. Move, call someone, do something. Look, Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was in that room with the wife of Al-Aziz and she tried to uh, seduce him, what did he do after he said Ma'ad Allah? After he mentioned Allah's name, he Allah Azza wa Jal said was al bab. He ran towards the door, teaching us move away from the place that you were going to commit the sin. After Allah gives you strength over your sin, move away from that place. Was al bab. Yusuf alayhi salam began to rush to the door, and of course the wife of Al Aziz began to chase him as well. And wallahi, if you do that, wallah, relief will come straight after that. Relief will come straight after that. Look at Yusuf alayhi salam. As soon as he reached the door, what happened? The king, the husband of that, uh, of that lady, Al-Aziz, opened the door. That's relief. That indicates relief. Allahu Akbar, finally relief came. So when you're tempted by a sin, Firstly, say Ma'ad Allah, remember Allah, take advantage of that feeling of fear of Allah in your heart. Move away from the place of the sin, run, move. Istabaqa al bab, run. And then the relief of Allah is going to come so, so, so knee, straight after it, it's going to come. And wallahi, wallahi, if you do this, you will never ever walk away empty handed. You will walk away with Iman revived in your heart. Look at this, Allah. You, you are going to do a sin. You stopped it. You're going to walk away with Iman revived in your heart. You're going to walk away knowing that you have genuine fear of Allah that exists in your heart. And you're going to walk away with a hasana ridden for you. Allahu Akbar.
As the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man hamma bi sayyatin falam ya'malha kutibat lahu hasana. Anyone who intended to commit a sin and then he doesn't end up committing this sin, Allah would record it for him one hasana. Allahu Akbar. Look what you walk away with when the genuine fear of Allah azza wa jal shines in your heart. So we need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to gain the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal, he says in the Quran in Surah Al-Mulk, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ Allah azza wa jal, he says, those who fear their Lord in the unseen, meaning those who fear their Lord when no one can see them but Allah, for them especially is مَغْفِرَةٌ a forgiveness. That's why I'm telling you, in order to achieve the forgiveness of Allah on the 15th night of Sha'ban, one must fear Allah when no one can see him. For such people, Allah said in Surah Al-Mulk, لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ For them is a forgiveness. وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ And a great reward. Anytime you see the word great reward in the Quran, it refers to the paradise. And what is greater than that reward? The paradise and the luxuries that are in it and the ultimate reward in the paradise. And that is to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do happen to fall into the sin because your desire overpowered you, then don't you dare allow yourself to enjoy the sin while you commit it. Let's just say, and inshallah, we never reach that stage. But let's just say that your desire overpowered you and you fell into this sin and you committed this sin. We ask Allah to forgive us and protect us. But if you do, then I tell you something. Don't you dare allow yourself to enjoy the sin. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, one of the main reasons for why we do not enjoy our worship, why we do not enjoy our recitation of the Quran, why aren't we enjoying our prayers and our fasting? One of the main reasons is because we're enjoying our sins. And you cannot have these two joys at the same time. Allah will not give you the joy of worship. And at the same time, you have the joy of sins in the heart. You choose one or, one or you're deprived of the other. This is why it's very important to repent straight away after the sin. Because if you repent after a sin immediately, then your repentance is a sign that you hate the sin, that you did not enjoy the sin. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the hadith of Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu an, man sarratu hasanatuhu wa sa'atu sayyatuhu fadhalikum al-mu'min. That the one who enjoys his hasana, the one who's happy when committing or engaging in a hasana, in a good deed, that's the believer. And the one who doesn't enjoy the sin, and he is displeased about the sin, then that is the believer. Allahu Akbar. Therefore, you must hate the sin. You must hate. You cannot enjoy the sin. Even let's say you fell into the sin, do not allow yourself to enjoy it. You must hate the sin at all times in order to not be deprived of the joy of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look, when Allah azza wa jal described Ibrahim alayhi salam's attitude towards sins, you know when Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam, when, when, when Ibrahim uh, alayhi salam, he wanted to destroy the idols. The idols, of course, they represent a major sin. That's shirku billah. That's a shirk. That's associating partners with Allah. That's the biggest sin on earth. How was his attitude towards it? When he went and broke those idols, Allah Azza wa Jal, he described exactly how Ibrahim destroyed the idols. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, فَجَعَلَهُمْ جُذَاذًا Judaven means he broke them into small pieces, almost powder. Now the idea is Ibrahim alayhi salam could have just smashed them once with the axe twice, broken them in three, four pieces. No, he didn't suffice with that. He broke them into a million pieces. Why? That implies his anger against the sin. This implies his hatred towards the sin. That he didn't only break the idol in two, three pieces. Rather, he smashed them until they almost became powder. That's his hatred against the sin. And look at the case of Musa alayhi salam. Also, when 
Bani Israel collected the gold and they melted the gold and they made a golden calf and they began to worship the calf. You know, that happened in the time of Bani Israel when Musa السلام, was talking to Allah جل, on the mountain. Later on, he came back and he saw that his people are worshiping a golden calf. Billah. They're worshiping other than Allah. So that, that golden calf is a major sin. Look what he did. He said, His hatred towards the sin was that he said, I am going to burn it. So he melted, he melted this golden calf. He burnt it. And then not only that, And then we're going to throw it as far as we can in a yam, in a river. Allahu Akbar. Yani Musa alayhi salam could have just threw the calf in the river or could have just burnt it or could have just smashed it and disfigured it. Why did he burn it, melt it, throw it in the river? Why? This is an implication of his hatred against the sin. We're not allowed to enjoy sins, my brothers and sisters in Islam. You're supposed to hate the sin. When you hate the sin, even if you commit the sin, you're supposed to hate it. If that's your attitude towards sins, bi-ithnillah, Allah Azza wa Jal will give you the enjoyment of good deeds. That's when you'll enjoy the good deeds. If you're going to enjoy sins, then no, you'll be deprived of enjoying worship. And wallah, I tell you, my brothers and sisters in Islam, today a lot of people complain, I don't enjoy my worship. I don't enjoy my recitation of the Quran. I don't enjoy fasting. I don't enjoy praying. I just do it and I feel like it's a burden and a load coming off me. And that's because you're enjoying the sin. When you begin to hate the sin from your heart, that's when Allah Azza wa Jal will bless you with the enjoyment of good deeds. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters in Islam, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never, ever, ever, ever got angry. Never. Only in one circumstance. And that is, when the prohibitions of Allah were violated. Allahu Akbar. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never ever ever retaliated for himself. Never got angry for himself. He only got angry if the prohibitions of Allah were violated. If sins were being committed. Why he got angry? Because he hates the sin. And if you hate the sin, you're angry when it's committed. So Allah Azza wa Jal hates the sin. And we must hate it as well, even if we fall into it. Never ever allow yourself to enjoy the sin. So going back to the hadith, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the hadith of the 15th night of Sha'bat, in where Allah Azza wa Jal is going to observe the hearts and is going to forgive all his creation. And I told you, in order to earn forgiveness, one must cease doing sins. And I just discussed to you now a practical method in how you stop sins. Allah Azza wa is going to forgive all his servants. Allahu Akbar. What an opportunity to earn the forgiveness of Allah. What an opportunity it is. Wallahi, what an opportunity it is to earn the forgiveness of Allah. During a time, we're living now in a time, during a time, which Allah is being يعني, so disobeyed the most. We're living in a time in which Allah is being disobeyed the most. Today's disobedience against Allah is unlike any nation of the past. So to have this opportunity of being forgiven in just a few days, it's gold, Allahu Akbar. If anything, it's teaching us the generosity and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, if Allah did not forgive our sins, then our sins are sure to destroy us. Our sins, wallahi, will attack us and destroy us. You know, al-maghfirah, which is the forgiveness of Allah, al-maghfirah. You know, it comes from the word mighfar. And mighfar is the battle helmet. You know, that the helmet that the soldier puts on his head. That's called a mighfar. And that helmet is supposed to prevent the soldier from attacks of the enemy. So it's like sins are like weapons that are going to come and attack you because sins will attack you. They will lead to your punishment. And if it wasn't for Allah Azza wa Jal's forgiveness, then your sins would have destroyed you and cut you into pieces long time ago. 
And you know, back in the times among the Arabs, there was a plant. It was known as al ghafar It was known as al ghafar Whenever someone was injured and was in pain, they would rub the oils of this plant on the wound. They would rub it on the wound. As though now, you see the word, it, يعني, المغفرة, it comes from the word al ghafar So as though our sins are pain, they are physical, mental, emotional pains. And al ghafur Allah, the most forgiving, is the one who takes care of our pains. He heals our pains by forgiving us. Allahu Akbar. The name of Allah, al ghafur makes you love Allah passionately. It makes you overwhelmed with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most dhikr that was on the tongue of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seeking the forgiveness of Allah was astaghfirullah. Did you know that? That was the most dhikr on the tongue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What are we without the forgiveness of Allah? Without the name of Allah, al ghafur we wouldn't have been able to live. Wallahi, wouldn't. Wallahi, we would have lived depressed lives for the rest of our life. But the name of Allah Azza wa Jal Al-Ghafoor saves us. Allahu Akbar. The fact that Allah Azza wa Jal forgives us. So this hadith here gives us hope that Allah is going to forgive all his creation. All the believers. Yes. Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive all the believers. During this time, I said to you, this is the most time in which Allah has ever been disobeyed on the face of the earth. But even then, Allah Azza wa Jal is going to forgive the believers, bi'ithnillah, except for two types of people. Now listen carefully. Because these two types of people are excluded from the mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the 15th night of Sha'ban. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the biggest shock in life is to know that you have been deprived from the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the biggest shock in life. So pay attention so that you're not one of these two categories. Two types are not forgiven. Mushrik or mushahin. Mushrik, a disbeliever. Mushahin, a person who holds hatred in his heart against another Muslim brother or sister. Mushrik is a person who is corrupt concerning his relationship with Allah. Mushahin is a person who is corrupt concerning his relationship with people. A mushrik is a disbeliever. Therefore, we learn from this hadith that you must have a correct belief in Allah in order to earn Allah's forgiveness on the 15th of Sha'ban. You must worship him alone without any partners. You must direct all your worship to Allah Azza wa Jal. You must rely only upon Allah. You must fear only Allah. You must love only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The love of Iman I'm speaking about that occupies your entire heart should be the love of Allah azza wa jal. You shouldn't be afraid of anyone but Allah azza wa jal. You know, a fee that you, you're, you're worshipping Allah with. Otherwise, there is a normal fee. You fear a lion, you fear a dog. This is normal fee, that's fine. But I'm speaking about fee that... Uh, you seek reward of and you seek worship behind, then that fee can only be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal will not forgive a mushrik on the 15th night of Sha'ban. Allah will not forgive people who rely on other than him. Allah will not forgive those who fee other than him and take it as a form of worship. Allah azza wa jal will not forgive those who love other than him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be careful. You need to avoid a shirk in all its forms, the minor and the major. Allah Azza wa Jalla said in the Quran, "Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushrak bih." Allah Azza wa Jalla does not forgive a person who associates partners with him that commits shirk. So we need to clear our hearts of all forms of shirk, major shirk, minor shirk, hidden shirk. Hidden shirk is arriya, arriya which is showing off. You need to clear your heart from all of this to earn the forgiveness. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, a dua he can say that would earn him complete forgiveness and safety from a shirk. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, أَلَا أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ إِذَا فَعَلْتَهُ 
ذهب عنك قليله أو كثيره وكثيره shall I not direct you towards where if you were to do them if you were to say them then Allah would remove away from you any form of minor shirk and major shirk in your heart or the minor amounts of arriya and the major amounts of showing off in your heart a shirk would be wiped away from your heart so then the nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said to him say allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lam wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam he said to him say oh allah i seek refuge in you that i associate anything with you knowingly and i seek your forgiveness for what I don't know. Allahu Akbar. This dua that you say, بِإِذْنِ Ta'ala, it will clear you from a shirk. It clears the heart from a shirk. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lam wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam. So that's the first category that is not forgiven. The one who has shirk in his life. So rush and clear your heart from a shirk and remain steadfast upon a tawheed the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the day you meet Allah azza wa jal and bi idhnillah you will see good results in this life and in the hereafter. And the second type of people that Allah azza wa jal does not forgive, listen very carefully, is al-mushahin. Wallahi, once again, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the biggest shock in your life is for you to know that your deeds of prayer and fasting and zakat and dhikr and all of this was rejected by Allah because you're a mushahin, because you held a grudge and a hatred and anim animosity and enmity and jealousy towards another Muslim brother or sister. Biggest shock, Allah, biggest shock to realize that all of your deeds have been rejected and you have been deprived of the forgiveness of Allah because of hatred that is in your heart towards a Muslim brother or sister. My brothers in Islam, mushahin, it comes from the word shahan. Shahan means to charge something up. You know, like in Arabic, when you've charged the phone, they say a shahin. The charger is called a shahin. And so a mushahin, the idea is that he's charged and his, his heart is filled with the hatred against his Muslim brothers and sisters. And he hasn't released that hatred yet. He hasn't released it. Such a person is deprived of the forgiveness of Allah on the 15th of Sha'bat. Al-Awza'i rahimahullah, he said, Al-Mushahin, Al-Mushahin is the one who holds hatred in his heart against the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even that, you got to be careful. The one who holds hatred in his heart against the companions, against a salaf against the pious predecessors, against the scholars, against the people of knowledge the authentic people I'm speaking about, even that would be considered hatred. You must clear your heart from that. How many people today take this topic lightly and they swear, uh, they curse mashayikh, they curse scholars, they blame scholars for the problems of the ummah and where it has led to. And I'm speaking about authentic, true and genuine scholars. Otherwise, uh, a and corrupt scholars among the ummah of Islam, they do exist and there's plenty of them. But be very careful that the companions of Rasulullah, the scholars of Islam, as Salaf, at Tabi'een, all of these people we must love. We must make dua for them, not hate them. So remove this ill feeling from your heart towards any of these great men and women that we had in our history of Islam. Ibn Thawban, <coughs> rahimahullah, he said, Al Mushahin. He's the one who neglects the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he has hatred towards the sunnah. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, al-mushahin is a couple of things. A mushahin mainly is the person who has hatred in his heart. That's the, that's the main thing that gathers all these types. He has hatred in his heart towards the sunnah of Rasulullah, towards the companions of Rasulullah, towards the teachers of Islam, towards the scholars and towards his Muslim brothers and sisters. Clear your heart from all this junk and garbage, from all this hatred, clear it. Allahu Akbar, my brothers and sisters in Islam, this part of the hadith is telling us to quickly reform and reconcile with our Muslim brothers and sisters, especially family members. Otherwise, Allah, you will be blocked and barred and deprived from the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
my brothers and sisters in Islam, clean your heart from ill feelings towards your Muslim brothers and sisters right now. This is how we're going to prepare for the forgiveness of Allah on the 15th night of Sha'ban. This is how we're going to prepare for it. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he was asked, كيف كنتم تستقبلون رمضان? Someone asked Ibn Mas'ud, you know Ibn Mas'ud was a companion of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone asked him, how did you companions, how did you used to welcome Ramadan? How would you welcome Ramadan? Listen to what he said. He said, ما كان أحدنا يجرأ أن يستقبل هلال رمضان وفي قلبه ذرة حقد على أخيه. الله أكبر. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, we would welcome Ramadan and none of us would dare to hold an atom's weight of hatred or enmity or jealousy towards each other. Allahu Akbar. We would not hold any enmity or hatred towards each other. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. This is how pure their hearts were towards the Muslim brothers and sisters in Islam. This is how pure their hearts were. Sort out your issues right now, I say to you, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Sort them out now in order to earn the forgiveness of Allah in the next couple of nights on the 15th night of Sha'ban. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, encouraging us to forgive one another. وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَصْفَحُوا Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَالْيَعْفُوا Go and forgive one another. وَالْيَصْفَحُوا And start a new page with your Muslim brother and sister. Pardon them, forgive them. أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ don't you or wouldn't you like for Allah to forgive you? In other words, if you love for Allah to forgive you, if you love to earn Allah's forgiveness, then go and forgive others. Deal with the people in the same way you want Allah to deal with you. This is what you need to do right now. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah, this is very important. Yani, how many people now that are listening and that will listen in the future and how many Muslims around the world right now there is an enmity, there's a problem between him and a Muslim brother or a sister. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, لا تقاطعوا ولا تدابروا ولا تباغضوا ولا تحاسدوا Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, do not boycott one another. Do not turn your backs on one another. Do not hold hatred towards one another. Do not be jealous of one another. Then he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وكونوا عباد الله إخوانا He said, be brothers to one another. In other words, the hadith, what it means is that brotherhood cannot be achieved unless those evil qualities that were mentioned at the beginning of the hadith are avoided. If you avoid boycotting each other and turning your backs to each other and avoid hatred to each other and avoid jealousy among each other, that's when true brotherhood will be established among the Muslims. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, it is unlawful for a Muslim to boycott, to stop talking, to his Muslim brother or sister for more than three days. It's not allowed to boycott and hate a Muslim for more than three days. The one who does this is deprived from the forgiveness of Allah. We don't only learn this in the hadith of the 15th night of Sha'ban, but it exists in another hadith. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith that the doors of the paradise are open every Monday and Thursday. And Allah forgives all his servants except a disbeliever. And then, except, there's another exception made. رَجُلًا كَانَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ أَخِيهِ شَحْنَا And Allah Azza wa Jal would deprive forgiveness to two people that had hatred towards each other. Allah Azza wa Jal would say to the angels, أَنظِرُوا هَذَيْنِ حَتَّى يَصْطَلِحَا أَنظِرُوا هَذَيْنِ حَتَّى يَصْطَلِحَا And he says it twice, Allah Azza wa Jal. He says to the angels, leave these two until they reconcile. Leave these two and their deeds. I will not accept anything. I will not forgive them until they reconcile and they reform and mend their relationship. How embarrassing. Muslims are not supposed to be like this towards each other. Rather, when we meet each other, we're supposed to say, Assalamu alaikum. We're making dua for each other. When I say, Assalamu alaikum to my Muslim brother, which is the default greeting between Muslims, I'm making dua for you. I'm saying may Allah's peace and may his blessing and may his mercy be upon you. I'm making dua for you. 
How then do you hold hatred in your heart against a Muslim brother? And you know, my brothers and sisters in Islam, you know why we are not allowed to hate a Muslim? Why? Why are we not allowed to hate a Muslim brother or sister? Because hatred towards a Muslim implies that the heart is attached to this worldly life and its luxuries. I mention it again. When you hate a Muslim brother or a sister hates a sister, this implies that the heart is attached to this worldly life and its luxuries. I tell you why. Because you only hated your Muslim brother or sister and you only boycotted them and stopped speaking to them most definitely because of something materialistic in this worldly life. Something worldly. Probably money. You couldn't come to a business agreement. Something related to business. A job. A car. Whatever it is. Look at the Muslims today. Those who hate each other or are jealous of each other or have boycotted each other. Wallahi, it's because of a worldly reason. They've hated each other and they've boycotted each other because of a world real reason. And so that means your heart is attached to this worldly life. So as a result, Allah Azza wa Jal made it haram for us to hate each other. Because the main cause of hatred and jealousy and boycott between people is this worldly life and its businesses and its beauties and luxuries. And this worldly life should have no true value in the hearts of believers. It should have no value in the heart of a believer. Therefore, it's not befitting for materialistic matters of this world to become a reason for you to disobey Allah by boycotting another Muslim or hating another Muslim, no matter how huge your issue was. And for a true sincere believer, it doesn't require more than three days to resolve the issue. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave us a maximum of three days to resolve our issues. So if hatred and boycotting continues for more than three days against your Muslim brother and sister, then that proves that the hearts are attached to this dunya, to this world and its luxuries and beauties. And this, if your heart is like that, it goes against the condition of forgiveness. And so a person isn't forgiven. Allahu Akbar. Is deprived of forgiveness. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, we're coming to the end now. My advice is, in a few days, literally, يعني, as I said to you, on Sunday night, the 28th of March, for those who started Sha'ban on the 15th of March, the 28th of March, Sunday, at Maghrib, is going to be the 15th night of Sha'ban. And most definitely, in authentic ahadith, this is a night of forgiveness. Every believer, bi idhnillah, Allahu Akbar, will be forgiven. In order to enter Ramadan and we're cleansed, this is the wisdom. In order to enter Ramadan and we are cleansed of our sins. Except for two people, a mushrik, a mushrik will not be forgiven. A disbeliever will not be forgiven. Anyone who has any form of shirk in his heart will not be forgiven. So clear your hearts from a shirk. Say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lam wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam. Say it, it will cleanse your heart from a shirk. And the other type that will not be forgiven, al-mushahin. Someone who holds hatred in his heart against another member of the Muslim community. So rush to reconcile with your Muslim brothers and sisters. Sit down and think about it. Is it worth it to hate this person? What have you hated him for? For a worldly matter, your heart is attached to this worldly life. Really? Forgive, let go. These things are only temporary. They will be gone. And our ultimate reward and permanent reward is the paradise and the luxuries and the gifts that Allah Azza wa Jal has promised us in the paradise. My brothers and sisters in Islam, at the end, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to purify our souls and our hearts. And I ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability that we are able to overpower our desires and our haram temptations. 
I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us the ability and the strength that we remain grateful to Him and that we remain consistent in our worship and our obedience towards Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Jazakum Allahu khayran, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.